Okay. I gotta start over. I gotta start over. Oh no! <laughs> um, sorry, bad camp. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I work for Think Shout. We're a small but growing agency that builds websites for nonprofit organizations such as the Southern Poverty Law Center, Facing History, Humane Society, and many others. We are also contributors to the Drupal community. Uh, we've contributed to the MailChimp modules, Red Hen CRM, and the Drupal 7 Salesforce suite. Enough about me. Let's talk about the differences between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 that are pertinent to front-end developers. First off, there's a shift from PHP template files, aka TPL, uh, TPL files, uh, to Twig. Essentially, they're both files that produce markup and probably have some coding logic mixed in. These are template files that tell the project what to render on the page, the element, the field, etc. What is Twig and how is it different? Well, let me demystify this for you. Ha ha ha. Okay. Tough room. <laughs> tough room. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. All right. <laughs> uh, Twig is a fairly simplistic PHP templating language. So instead of writing a bunch of verbose PHP, you write much cleaner looking code. Twig is a compiling language for markup. So uh, similar to how SAS compiles our theming work into computer readable CSS, Twig is compiled into PHP readable templates, which are then rendered on the web page. It's kind of a lot to, to chew on, so I'll elaborate a little bit more. When a, page, when a project page renders, it converts what you've written in Twig and compiles it using a PHP script. And if you're curious, this is where those PHP scripts live in the Drupal project. The script essentially stores the compiled code into memory and then turns it into the, the page that we're visiting. Here's a screenshot of the homepage of Twig. I highly re recommend getting uh, familiar with the Twig documentation. I refer to it often when I'm working. And uh, the Drupal community has also created some super helpful Twig functions, and those can be f found in Drupal.org. And I've included uh, a couple of those resources at the end of my slide deck, and I um, will also made my make my slide deck available to you on the Bad Camp page for this talk. Okay, so here we're looking at essentially the same code uh, crossed over from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8. There are noticeable differences in syntax. TPL files have PHP right in the code versus uh, the twig curly brackets. Um, if, if you try commenting out lines of code in the TPL files, uh, it can make my brain hurt because there are still PHP <coughs> tags and it just is hard to look at. Uh, when you comment out lines in uh, the twig files, it comments out the full line. It's much easier to understand. <clears throat> okay, so when we moved from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, there was less need for, uh, for hooks in theming. As, as a Drupal 7 uh, front-end dev, we have choices when we need to change the markup. We could override a template, and this might not work in some instances. We could use a hook like a preprocess, but that's backend land, and we have to ask our backend developer friends. And uh, plus, I feel like it's not generally good coding practice to be writing markup in the backend. So, um, meh. <coughs> also, we could convince I, our designer to change their mind of how uh, how to theme their design, which no, no. just <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I make it a point to try and make uh, my designer's designs um, into reality, regardless. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, let's see. Okay, so in Drupal 7, overriding templates has never been easier. It gives you more control of the logic for displaying elements, and everybody wins, including your designer, who's very, very pleased that you're able to theme their designs. Drupal 7, we had the luxury of debugging right in the template files. We could throw a debugger point in there, run it, and we could get all of our 
um, template, va uh, template variables that were available. And uh, Drupal 8, we didn't have that at first. We couldn't throw a breakpoint in the twig file. But we do have a lot more tools. Da -na -na -na. <laughs> so I'm going to address those. <laughs> one of these new tools are, um, one of the new tools is file name suggestions. It takes just a little bit of configuration, namely setting your twig dot uh, config debug setting to true. Uh, and once you've done that, you maybe have to clear the cache, refresh your page. And when you inspect the element, you have access to this. If you look at begin output, which is at the bottom, you see exactly which template file is being rendered <coughs> and where. The X, if you look on the left, you see the stars and then the X um, on besides node.html.twig. Uh, that file name suggestion indicates that that template is already being used. The order of the file names is listed from the most specific at the top to the most generic at the bottom. And depending on the level of specificity, you can choose a file name that suits your needs in the best way, and Drupal is smart enough to adhere to the file uh, name rules of specificity. So I'll take you through a little practice project and give you an idea of uh, how this works and how to apply these tools. I went to Costa Rica last March, and there's so much wildlife, and I saw this sloth, and I nearly freaked out <laughs> and scared a bunch of Costa Ricans, um, uh, ran down, and, and I don't know, I just had to include this sloth in my, in my presentation, because it's a sloth. Okay, so I was so inspired by the wildlife, I decided to create a website about it. Okay. This is a website um, with posts about all the fun wildlife in Costa Rica. So the backend developer, they, uh, they set up a listing page using right out of the box Drupal article nodes and arranged the fields for viewing them in, in their teaser view mode. So they've already done that. And when we go to inspect the element, these are the file name suggestions that we see. The goal that we have is to apply the same styles uh, to all article teasers. Now remember that the suggestions go from, the, uh, from more specific at the top to more generic at the bottom. So uh, can everybody see those okay? Okay, anyone wanna raise their hand and say which one we should use if we're theming article teasers? Anyone? All right. Well, we got somebody in the center here sitting in the chair. Yes. So, the Nice. You got it. That's the one we're going to use. Okay, now that we know which file name suggestion we're going to use, where on earth do we put this? Well, your themes, custom, your theme directory, in this case, mine is ThinkBase. Templates directory would be a good path. And I've created a nodes directory and place, uh, so that I can place um, any templates associated with nodes, such as this one. The same can be done for blocks, field, template types, etc. Okay, so I've created this new template file and, I, and I've put it in those directories. And uh, then I find the twig file that Drupal is using from the begin output. Once I've done that, I copy and paste the code into my new file and clear the cache. And we're good to go. We're themers, we know how this is done, and we're rock stars. We've got, um, we can override the original template safely, we can wrap elements and divs if we need to. Um, this is what we do. So what's next? Okay, we are going to theme a call to action block. Does everybody know what a call to action block is? <coughs> Anybody who doesn't? Okay, we all got it. So the backend developer uh, creates a CTA block type with a tile view mode. And they add a new CTA, this new CTA block and place the block using the block 
layout UI. Pretty standard. All right, it's our turn. So we're going to style all of the CTA blocks using the tile view mode. We're going to style that the same way, and we're going to apply a background image. This is the block that we're going to create. And this is namely why I'm not, a, not, I'm not a designer. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to help raise money to generate awareness about how feeding wildlife, like these cute coatis begging for food, is a problem. I mean, it's a really, really big problem in Costa Rica. There are even signs that say don't feed the coatis, but there are tourists stopping on the side of the road. Okay, I'll just get off my soapbox. <laughs> Back to the task. Theme all the CTA blocks using the tile view mode. Okay, so we go to inspect the element, and here are the file name suggestions. And uh, wait a second here. I don't see a CTA block or tile view mode. What under? What am I supposed to do with this? Oh, I mean, am am I set the theme now? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, I can think of a couple directions that we could go with this. Um, okay, there are really five options. Um, we could use a pre-process hook to create a wrapper around our block element, but wouldn't that be writing markup in the back end? Yeah, I'm not going to list this here. We could use paragraphs. Uh, so if you're using blocks in paragraphs, Paragraphs provides a parent wrapper, which is handy. Um, and uh, I, I used this just recently on one of our projects when we had, um, uh, it was uh, two CTA blocks side by side, but they could also be with a checkbox. No, um, there was logic to check to see if there was one block or more than one block. And it would all be within the same um, element on the page. Both, uh, both situations styled completely the same, but they needed one parent wrapper. That was a great use case for this. So um, just to give you an idea of how to use that. You can also use Display Suite, which um, uh, you can create a view mode and, and uh, Display Suite essentially provides a default template for that view mode. And you can override that too. And uh, I'll go into that in a little bit uh, more detail in the next few slides. You can also create a file name suggestion with a bit of code. And uh, this is what I'll be using for my example because it's a really lightweight solution. Lastly, there's a, w a way to specify view modes in your template. And I'll touch on that towards the end. OK, so just to give you a little idea of how to do this in Display Suite, uh, this is part of the UI that's found on the Content Types Manage Display tab at the bottom. Uh, when you're looking at this uh, content type. The top list of options are from the layout discovery uh, module. Those are layout discovery templates. Uh, layout discovery, I believe, is still an experimental module. Just a heads up, because that can be tricky when up updating Drupal core. Um, and it's, yeah, did I say it was a dependency of Display Suite? Layout discovery is, so good to know. Uh, these are the Display Suite templates, the ones in um, Surrounded by Orange. Both are customizable. So once you select which layout to use, the Display Suite template file name suggestions will be available, available to you, like so. And that's the one that we would use that we would then um, create a, a custom template for and override the template. Uh, yeah, so we would put it in our in our theme, our templates directory, and I created a display suite directory to put it in. After clearing the cache, we get a couple of classes that make theming this block more helpful, like the type CTA block and the V mode tile. Uh, and now we've got our wrapper cl classes to work with. Awesome. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a better idea of how to use Display Suite to get what you need. It's a totally viable solution. And as I mentioned, I'm going to create a custom file name suggestion. And I find this to be a simple approach with not too many lines of code and no additional configuration. 
and it and also helps to minimize site bloat because uh, display suite does give you a lot of stuff that you might not necessarily need. Don't worry, I made these slides available. <laughs> I don't expect you to write this down. Uh, so this code uses hook theme suggestions hook alter. And uh, it takes an array of suggestions in the variables and allows a, a developer to create al an alternative file name suggestion for a specific element, in this case blocks. This example here creates a naming convention that includes block types as a file name suggestion that is recognized by Drupal. Um, once that's done, clear the cache, and yay, we have our file name suggestion that is actually usable. We're good to go. Um, so now, now we can override the template, and uh, and we've we're we're set. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Um, so now we've got debugging tools, which is the real meat of this. This is the good stuff. Um, first, we've got twig dump, and that'll help dump the information about a template var variable right on the page for you. So you apply dump within uh, the curly brackets, add to your twig, uh, add your twig variable. In this case, it's content, and you get something that looks like this. So unless you're really good at guessing, this is a total time suck. At least for me, I like dump. There's a place for dump, but this doesn't get me what I need. Um, next is Devel and Kent. Uh, so you can do, uh, download and enable the Devel module. It'll come with Devel Kent. Uh, so you, you enable Devel and Devel Kent, and then the Kent variable will uh, will be available for you as a Twig function, just like Dump. Uh, but unlike Dump, Kent gives us the ability to dig deeper by clicking on the content variables to open them up and see what's inside. This gets us the majority of the way there. We can see what we need. We've got our body field, our background image field, and our link field. Uh, let's see. When I tried using Kent, though, um, I found out that it's a rather expensive tool. It has a tendency to max out the memory and drag the site down. So uh, extra configurations would likely be necessary if this is a tool that, that really works for you. Um, I also have a colleague that uses Kint Search, and he swears by it. It allows the user the ability to search for variables and values right in Kint. Definitely worth looking into. There's likely other tools out there. Um, I was reading a bunch of blog posts and on this subject, and people brought up Code Lobster that might be worth looking into. And if anybody else has other suggestions, please feel, feel free to share it at the end. This is my favorite, xDebug, right in PHP Storm. It's brilliant. Um, and it integrates really, really nicely with PHP Storm. So when I'm working on backend tasks, this tool is invaluable. Uh, I can see the call stack, uh, which means I can, I can see the files that were executed before I, step, I stopped my program. I can set variables to be watched and step through the code to see if and when my, vari my variable value changes. I can get variable paths and values. It's awesome. So here's where we get to the juicy part. But first, <laughs> I want to share a little story. Back in the day, soon after Drupal 8 uh, was first released, uh, this amazing fellow figured out a way to debug twig files. Now you. Uh, do you remember how um, my mentioning that when a twig file is compiled, a PHP script is generated? Well, Drupal has a way of caching these. So at first, they weren't available to us as devs. After setting up some, some configurations, namely the ones that, uh, that he mentions in his blog post, and using xdebug uh, to set up a listener, I was able to set a breakpoint on these one-time generated PHP twig uh, compiling scripts and get what I need. And that's where I would look for those files. And if you see off to the, off to the left, those are where the scripts are. They're one-time generated and it was like he'd just throw a timer on it and it would just stop it. Um, 
I'd set a break point and all was wonderful. Wonderful, so wonderful in fact, that I actually wrote a, a blog post on it and I guess that was over a year ago. Time flies. Um, I submitted a talk to DrupalCon, which got accepted. It was my first talk at DrupalCon. Finally carved out some time to work on the talk three weeks before DrupalCon because I was working on WordPress for a while before then, <laughs> only to discover the method no longer worked. It was totally deprecated. Um, the system of caching had changed such that the PHP script uh, is only run once, so I was unable to actually trigger the breakpoint by refreshing my page. That was quite the three weeks of trying to figure out how to actually create this talk when, it, when my tool was gone. Um, so after taking numerous deep breaths into paper bags, <laughs> And realizing that there were probably other people in the Drupal community that felt as passionately about debugging as I did, I did some research. And I found this, Twig XDebug. This Twig XDebug module, along with installing Drupal Console, I've got links at the end, gave me exactly what I was looking for. Better yet, rather than debugging the PHP scripts, we can debug right in our Twig files. Holy cow, yay! Is anyone else excited about this? Seriously. <laughs> um, I've been using this module ever since, and it's been such a critical tool for us that we've even added it to our build scripts. So, go for it. Use it. So you get yourself set up with Twig XDebug, the necessary libraries, and Drupal console. Then you grab the template file you wish to debug, and hey, now I've got a breakpoint twig function, just like dump or kint. I clear the cache, uh, turn on my listener, refresh, and the breakpoint function triggers a script in red. Uh, yeah, you see it on the red tab. That's, it'll, it'll just like take you to that, to that file, and so you kind of have to go back. Um, and uh, it stops right in, in the template and gives you the twig variables and the information that you have available to you. You gotta know where to, where to look when you get all these variables <laughs> because Drupal arrays can take you deep, 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 deep into an infi infinite rabbit hole of option madness. <laughs> I'll save you some guesswork. <laughs> okay. So this is what your debugger looks like. I know it's really, really hard to read. Uh, it's, this is what it looks like when it stopped. And to be more specific, okay, hopefully people can see that better. Now I've got access to my fields. I've got my body field in blue at the bottom. I've got my background image and link field. Okay, so what we get in PHP Storm isn't exactly what Twig needs. <clears throat> okay, so whenever possible, add the, add the field value completely using um, content.fieldName, and that's what Twig is looking for. Uh, it'll keep the integrity of your field configurations intact, such as image dimensions, trim text, etc. So if you go any deeper, then you might lose that metadata. So content.fieldName is the way to go when and whenever possible. I put together a couple other Twig recommendations for you that I lovingly call my Twig Twigtionary. Actually, I stole that from a colleague because I thought it was clever. <laughs> First tip, <clears throat> ignore the context variable and what comes next. Twig is smart enough to find what it needs from content. So you can see how that translates. No bells or whistles. Okay, second tip, keep the integrity of any symbols present. So uh, see how there's a, a pound before the V mode? Just keep that, but strip content of the, the, rest of, the rest of the symbols. If an arrow exists, treat the method in the same way as arrays. So you can notice how the arrow actually becomes a dot. And yes, you perceptive people probably noticed that in my last example, 
um, I was diving into the objects array of values. I was looking for uh, uh, an example. <laughs> and I admit that probably wasn't a very good example because that twig variable didn't actually produce any results. Uh, but if I put a dot value on the end, then I get exactly what I need. Because how do I, and how do I know that? Because I used twi I used twig dump and uh, tried it out to see if I could actually get anything. And if you don't get anything, it'll it'll probably read null. But it's it's a good way to check. And that's what it looks like. Okay. Remember that block that we wanted to create? Here's the markup. <clears throat> We've got our div with our background image, and it's wrapping around the title, the label, uh, title slash label, the body, and link field. And oh hey, I even set a twig variable of my own to get the view mode associated with the current block that's being rendered. And now I'm, um, oh yeah, and then I can also set this, this view mode uh, class to change dynamically depending on if I need a CTA block to be using a different view mode, but I can keep the same template. Okay, now the background image twig variable path would have taken me forever if I didn't have the proper debugging tools. And here's how my team and I figured that out. We know content dot field background image will give us access to any specifics around that field. <clears throat> we know that uh, as front end developers, that setting an image as a background requires getting that image's file path. Drupal has a couple of its own tweak functions, and one is file uh, URL. Um, and you can read this, well, I'll read the description. This, this uh, helper function accepts a relative path from the root and creates a relative URI path to the file. Super helpful. Uh, Drupal has a couple of its own twig functions. Uh, oh yeah, I already said that. Sorry, I'm repeating myself, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> okay, so this example shows, shows us that we can get the entity property values like this. And so it's a matter of finding the right twig variable path, such as entity, uh, that can find the URI value. And after some trial and error, this is the least verbose way we could grab the image, uh, the background image field URI. Uh, and as you may have guessed, adding the, the zero and then um, item was required. And the URI value couldn't be found without it. So I thought I'd save you a little bit of time by giving you that. <laughs> uh, to make our lives even more easy, uh, you may or may not have heard of twig field value. I think it's actually probably pretty well known by now because Drupal 8's been around for about two years now. But this module allows themes to get partial data from, fi from field render arrays without all the massive digging into the trenches of potential infinity. So this is what we can turn it into when we use twig field value. Much cleaner, much more stable code. So now that I'm bringing up images, we've, we've got this issue between the image module and the media module. And the media module makes things more complex. Image is what you get just out of the box. But sometimes our clients need responsive images. So we need to use the media module. <clears throat> so, my solution, because I tried digging in and I tried to find the background image URL or URI and turn it into a URL, it just wasn't working. So, I brought cookies up to my backend developer and I said, can you please just give me a twig, var twig variable that I can use that's the URL? Um, and that's what they did. So, uh, that's a solution that'll save you some time. And it'll also give you a very nice, clean variable. <laughs> um, so that's media module. If you want to use media module, I suggest, unless somebody has a better idea, that you just ask your backend developer, maybe with some cookies, um, to make you that, that variable. Much cleaner than that. And then we won't have to be sad, sad pandas. Mm. As I wrap up my talk, I thought you might appreciate some extra words of wisdom. 
I recommend creating the shortest rendered code possible. If it's getting long, chances are there's a better and shorter way to get what you need. Try not to use array placements like uh, 0, 1, 2, etc. Um, those items can be more susceptible to change, and I learned that the hard way. <clears throat> Sometimes dot zero is the best route, like in the background image example. Um, and everything, of course, gets easier with practice. So the more you do it, the more you'll come up with tricks, and the more it'll just become second nature. With Drupal 8 still undergoing some changes, Debugging can certainly change too. It's the nature of our work. So I recommend um, getting to know Twig. The more you work with it, the more you like it. Or at least that's, that was the case for me. And uh, get some practice creating some custom templates. And um, Drupal 8 will really make that a priority. Take advantage of some custom template creation and it'll free you up to do amazing work and write all current wrappers you want and also know where to look. Don't rely on mediocre tools that won't give you exactly what you need. Dive right in and get exactly the right information the first time. <laughs> all right. That was a lot. <laughs> Anybody have any? Oh. Sorry to make you drink from the water hose. <laughs> That's how I roll. Um, anybody have any questions? Anyone? <coughs> yes. Since there aren't any like real valuable questions, I'm gonna ask the baby girls. Please. What? There's a pretty strong emphasis on debugging, so I'm not really a front end developer. What what would happen? Give me an example of what would happen why we even need to debug. Um okay, so I when I first started theming in Drupal 8, all we knew about was using dump. And so I would throw these random variables, twig variables, and you know, you can, you can see what content outputs and then you can... Uh, Let me back up. I may sure. have asked the wrong question. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. What would you have done that, oh my gosh, I can't, I, I need to debug this. Like, what, did you, what happened to even need to run dump? I went crazy. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> what, That's what, what happened. You, what <laughs> kinds of problems? What kind of problems? Oh, what, oh, what well. What are you solving? What, did, what broke in the first place? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, um, gosh. I mean. Amy, can I take a stab at it? Amber, take a stab. Because you need to know um, what content to output. So that's why you need to debug and twig is because you you need to know, your, the whole point of it is to output values to a page. And so you need to know what dynamic content, what those, that dynamic content is called, those variables. Otherwise, you, you, and you've got nothing to output. So that's why we do by in Twig, is because you need to know what the names of things are so that you can actually output them to the page. Mm -hmm. Right, so if Drupal doesn't give, a, give it to us right out of the box, or we need to actually create a parent wrapper so that we can, around like, Say, say you've got um, a content teaser and there's an image on one side and then you've got all this text on the other. Ideally, we'd like to wrap all of the text fields in a parent wrapper, uh, but Drupal doesn't tend to give us that out of the box. So we need to you know, render the field first and then um, write the parent wrapper and then render those text fields. We have to split it up. So it sounds like it's not debugging in the sense of there's a bug, let's figure out how to get rid of it, but in the sense of tools to see what's going on. You got instant. Right. Yeah. Does, does that help? In a PHP function, you have a list of all your variables as you go through it, but in a Twig template, you don't. Right. Like, you just kind of have to figure out what your variables are called. Yeah. Would it be equivalent to like printing an array and finding out when you need to pull like variables from in your PHP? That would be the equivalent. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I, I basically took my back end practice and I made it a front end practice. Marisa has got a question. Uh, one comment. Uh, in addition to the quick debug, if you are, are already using the debug module, the debug module also provides a a big function that you can call and you will do exactly the same. Oh, totally. So if, if you don't, I mean, depending on where you're using it already, you might not need the extra module. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, that's all debugging tools are great. So, yes. One thing I'd suggest people be careful about is um, if you're within a node template, it's generally fine. But when you're digging deep yeah. into nested render arrays, you need to be careful, particularly like if you're at, say, the page level and you're diving into a node. If you grab a value from a field, uh, it's not going to have the cacheability metadata, and uh, you really need to have a render array that has that caching metadata. Or if you have something from multiple nodes, like one node is going to get cached, and then every single page is going to have that same thing. So that's kind of just a heads up as something to maybe investigate for people and, and, and learn more about. That's an excellent point. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I just have a couple of tips slash tools. So my favorite um, can replacement is called Twig Bar Dumper. Um, it's a lot faster and it's also responsive. So like if you're debugging a block and you're trying to use Kint in a block in a sidebar and it's like running off the page, Twig Bar Dumper will just very nicely go into that little block and it'll display the same array information. It's a lot more performant and you don't run into PHP um, like time limit oh, errors as much at okay. all. I, like, I find it much less frustrating. Yeah. The other thing, if you're trying to dump the content variable, you're probably gonna run into uh, memory limit errors. And so uh, what I like to start out with is dumping underscore context pipe keys, mm. and that will just um, give you all the keys for the array. So then you can identify the key and then dump that specific content dot key. That's and that's just a lot more sane way of debugging because on some template files like the node one, if you dump content, well, good luck to you. Exactly. So. <laughs> Thanks, Amber. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank Thanks, you. Amy. That was great. That was good. Okay. Yay! <laughs>